Welcome back to this technical series on Catran design with Antoine Richer. Now, again, if you haven't watched the previous episodes, we have discussed lots of different aspects of Catran design from hull shape to, to the importance of dagger boards. And today, what we're going to talk about is the strength of hulls. Now, this is super important and super interesting to me. So, Antoine, welcome back. Thank you for taking your time to discuss aspects of all different Catran design with us. Jumping straight in, I'm going to just come up with the question, are faster hulls stronger? Do you see any weaknesses in high volume catamarans uh, pro mass produced in factories? So faster hull naturally stronger, I would say yes, but it's a consequence. And uh, so I will explain that. Um, so first, I think some people could think that the bulkier the catamaran is, the stronger it is. But like you would think on a four-wheel drive car, four-wheel drive cars, big, strong, but that's not really the case for a catamaran. Um, it's actually the opposite. Um, a performance catamaran, performance uh, uh, cruiser catamaran will face waves at a higher speed. So the pressure impact will be higher. And, uh, and you need to design, you, you need to take this in consideration when you when you calculate your, 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 your structure. Um, if your catamaran hit a big wave or big wave break on a narrow performance, narrow hull, it will create less stress than uh, on a uh, high volume because the surface are not, uh, it's, it's, it's not the same surface. Uh, the narrow hull will go through, um, through the wave more easily and if a wave break on a on the on the deck if the deck is massive it will create a lot of stress so basically what you're saying is that the narrower holes dissipate the wave energy eat more you know more efficiently so it's dissipation of force yes yeah we, okay. you, when you when we calculate the the, the structure um, for example the deck you take into account the, the surface the total surface of your deck um, to calculate the, the impact okay. of the of the of the of the wave. So the the analogy that I would kind of con construct in my own mind as someone who's not you know a, a naval architect, it's a bit like a diver, an Olympic diver diving off a ten meter board and entering the water perfectly and not disrupting the water, comparing to me at forty eight years jumping off the diving board at ten meters and you know hitting the water on his gut. So it, that's what we're talking about, is it? Yeah, exactly. So Nick Fabry versus Tom Daly. Okay, okay, that, that's probably an image you don't want in your mind. Um, so I'll move swiftly on, but it is to do with how um, wave and water energy is dissipated. So in this sense, in this sense the, 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 the faster hull are naturally stronger. Um, and really the performance cats, performance cruiser are often blue water cruiser and uh, they need to be engineers to overcome harsh condition and um, yeah, and therefore they are the faster hurler needs to be uh, needs to be stronger and i think we're going to deal with this in a, in a later episode about talking about actual materials and uh, you know obviously saving the best to last if you're if you're a nerd and into this sort of thing like i am but from the point of view of materials science obviously you, when you are designing if you had Say, for instance, you uh, you had two jobs. One was to design a, a 45 foot high volume um, cruising catamaran for a family. And the same, you had also had another job of doing the, a 45 foot performance cruiser. Would you choose different materials to make sure that the strengths were uh, higher for the performance cruiser? Sure. Yeah, you would use different material, um, different um, um, the arrangement of your structure will be different, yeah, completely. So that's to do with the resins that you use, obviously the, the matrix, so you're using, you know, fiberglass mat versus um, polymer versus carbon fiber, and this all contributes to, to the structural integrity, as well as things like how the stringers are placed, you know, to give the, the, the hull its, its, its strength. And you also have the method of uh, construction, um, the way you're um, your furniture integrated into the hull. Um, is it bonded? Is it post tapered? Is it yeah, all these participate to the 
So the internal structural integrity of a hull is also to do with how, you know, whether you're laminating furniture molding ins. I mean, that to me makes sense. We saw that on the 1260 uh, and we've seen it in other catamarans. So there are other catamarans that use molded furniture. Um, so that obviously adds to the, the internal strength because you've got, you know, actual physical, you know, uh, you know, physical moldings that increase the integrity. Yeah, they participate to the, to the structure. This is not just weight. So, so uh, this is going to be a slightly controversial question then. So really, if you are buying a catamaran and you're looking at a catamaran that is, is rated to go around the world, then some are inherently going to be safer than others based on everything you've said. Mm. Yep. And so would you say that in certain cases, um, buying a catamaran that has a lot of say, you know, if I go to the opposite of what you've recommended, where all the furniture is imported and put in, you know, like, you know, Ikea after the fact and not part of the mold and where you've got um, a structure that is, you know, not as strong because it's built for a cruising market. Is that inherently less safe in, in bad weather? If the structure is, is really strong, even if the block are added later and they don't participate to the structure, it, it's okay, but it just means your boat really will be uh, extremely uh, heavy. Um, but yeah, heavy, but generally I'd say uh, yes, less, less safe. And so, okay, so I mean, yeah, obviously I'm not suggesting that any catamaran is inherently unsafe when it comes out of the factory, but some are safer than others. Mm, totally, yeah. Mm. Okay, well, that brings me conveniently onto my next question, which is writing moment. Now, that is something which there's a lot of confusion about on the internet. So I would like your definition of it as a naval architect as writing moment. Write it right, writing moment. Writing moment. Yeah, the writing moments, it's, uh, it's actually very simple. Huh? It's, um, it's the capacity of the boat to return to the static position. Yeah. So it's completely put with with a mast completely perpendicular to the to to the to the, to the sea. Okay. Yeah, the hill is uh, zero degrees. Uh... Okay. So, talk to me about writing movement and how writing moment actually differs between different types of catamaran. Whether you're looking at a cruising or performance catamaran. So first, the writing moment on the catamaran. It's the relationship between the weight and the width. Um, if you really want to simplify, you multiply the, the, the uh, it's the weight and the width, and the higher the writing moment is, the higher the capacity to, cr to carry a uh, sail area is. But on uh, either performance cruiser catamaran or charter catamaran, they all have a far, far enough writing moment. That's not the that's not an issue with that. So, um, so you will see on the performance cat uh, f less writing moment than on the cruising, uh, ch sorry, charter catamaran. So hang on. So there's the writing moment on a cruising catamaran is lower than on a performance catamaran? No. On a performance catamaran, the writing moment is lower than on a charter catamaran. And does that... Because... Because it's got a higher sail area and because... But what advantage does that convey? Which has the greater advantage, the cruising catamaran or the, or the, or the, or the performance catamaran? On the, the performance catamaran. Hang on, I'm confused. So, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a, bit, it's a bit confusing, but you want... Um, it, it's a consequence. The, you want less writing moment because you want less weight. Right, so the lower the weight, so basically you're trying to keep the weight of the boat down to increase performance. Yes. So right, a, a reduced writing moment is a consequence of having a lighter boat with a higher sail area. Okay, that makes sense. So obviously if you've got like a huge big volume catamaran that's full of dishwashers and washing machines with a small sail, it's going to have a much higher writing moment because all the weight's down low. Exactly, yes. Yeah. But if you've got this flighty little catamaran with a you know a massive mainsail in a high sail area, the, then the consequence of building a performance catamaran is that the writing moment is lower. 
Yes. If you have a if you have a catamaran that's really perform well, if you are near to flying the um, the windward hull, yes, you you want more writing moment. But on all the charter cat, you are far far from that. You will break the mast uh, long before uh, you can fly the, uh, your your main hull. That's why you have to respect, yeah, the reefing. So, so the other thing that we've kind of said, and again, we've been monohull sailors for years, we can feel when to reef our boat. We know when to reef. We know when it's overpressed. We know when it's bearing, you know, when, when we lose the helm. But Catarang, you sail by numbers, don't you? Because you can't feel a heel. Exactly. Okay, so, mm. so I'm assuming that, therefore, if the writing moment of a performance Catarang is lower, then you need to reef earlier. Um, not necessary, no. Okay. Because, I mean, one thing that it took me a long time to understand um, when I was learning to sail is that reefing doesn't make your boat slower. It makes it faster. Because you are essentially making the optimum use of your weather conditions um, and adjusting sail to, you know, to, to, to adjust that. Okay. You can trim your sail get better angle of attack, better incidence, and get the most of our uh, of your of your sail. Yeah, so efficiency. So basically it's the same with catamarans, that you're basically reducing sail area to be make things more efficient, but that also ties into safety. Mm. Correct. Because I do not, I cannot see myself in any position in the next 20 years where I'm going to want to lift the hull. <laughs> not, not on a cruising boat. Uh, that's going to be a bad day at sea when we're lifting a hull. I mean, I don't mind dropping it, but we're, we're pretty conservative sailors. I, you know, I, 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 you, literally, I'm not going to be that guy. He says now, this is going to be played back on, on CNN and Fox News like in about 10 years' time when I lifted the hull. But nonetheless, it's, it's not for me. And I think conservative sailors, I think we do need to be aware of writing moment. And I do accept that it is a consequence of building a light boat with a big mast, that it's not going to, it doesn't have that right moment. Perfect. Okay. So writing moment, how well the boat is able to, to deal with, with writing and moving away, you know, moving back to, to the, 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 the mast completely upright. This is gonna be a bigger topic and I wanna discuss bridge deck clearance because this is huge. Now, our understanding of it, for those of you who don't know, bridge deck clearance is actually the clearance between underneath the bridge deck and the water. And people talk so much about slamming. Does the boat slam? And it's probably one of the biggest comments we get on all these Catamaran reviews that we've done. Why aren't you mentioning bridge deck clearance? Now, our understanding of it is that it is so, there are so many things that, that influence slamming. Bridge deck clearance is one, the shape of the nacelle is another, the trim of the boat is a third. So over to you, let us, give us your thoughts on bridge deck clearance. Yeah, bridge deck clearance, it's, a, it's a really, it's an important um, aspect of, of the design. Um, because, as you said, you reduce slamming, and if you reduce slamming, you reduce the, the crew discomfort, you have less stress on the structure, uh, less boat speed reduction due to the slamming uh, by the wave drag. Um, so, really, you want to have your uh, bridge deck about 6-7% of the waterline length. For example, <coughs> for thirty. Yeah, that's a number. There's actually a formula then. I didn't realize this. So, okay. So it seems strange to me. But how, so just like what I'm confused about. So basically bridge deck clearance is six to 7% of the waterline length of the hulls. So I have, so that formula has obviously been around for a while. It's not something which you've just, you know, made up. I'm assuming that there's generations of naval architects that understand that this is a ratio. Why is it that we see so many catamarans that have got such low bridge deck clearance? I have seen catamarans that 50 foot that have never got anywhere near six, seven percent bridge deck clearance. Maybe they are too heavily loaded and uh, the passenger they put too much stuff in it. Uh, <clears throat> but that's true. Eh? Some that's maybe some naval architect they don't get the number right and. Um, for for example, for a 35 uh, foot catamaran, you want minimum 650 millimeter. Um, I would say that's the that's the minimum. And at 40, do you say 35 foot? Okay. 
35 foot. Yeah, so, and for 40 uh, foot, you want like, you want uh, 750. That's really interesting. So it's done by formula. And yes, it, this, it, apparently it feeds into what our understanding is that slamming is, a, is contributed, you know, what contributes to slamming is bridge deck, uh, you know, the weight of the catamaran. Because yeah, it's now obvious that the more, the, the lower the boat sits in the water, the, you're reducing bridge deck clearance, which contributes to slamming. Okay, that's, yeah, pretty interesting. Okay, so bridge deck clearance and slamming, again, there is a formula and that bridge deck clearance is affected by weight. And then that that obviously contributes to crew comfort. Um, but there are disadvantages to high bridge deck because otherwise everything would have high bridge deck. Yes. Yeah, if you have a high bridge deck, everything will be higher, which leads to a um, less aesthetic design. Uh, and you will have the, this problem of windage. Um, and um, the difference from the saloon to the to the hull you will have more step um, and um, and a higher roof and you don't you don't really want a massive roof uh, because of the windage and uh, aesthetic okay perfect so the other thing that we have um, looked at and it is, is nacelle nacelle design um, which essentially is you know the underneath of the bridge deck and um, how that is shaped to kind of allow water to water and now as per our previous episode uh, air pass underneath um, and through that so that has obviously evolved loads over the years and we you know so talk to me about na nacelle design so nacelle design you can improve the um, improve the, the design of the, of the of the bridge deck by uh, the flange the inboard flange that connects the um, uh, the, 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 this flat surface to the inboard hull. If you make it curved, it will help to to, to spread the to spread the wave. Uh, it's it's better than uh, having a flat flat surface. Um, so the so the so basically having a curved flange between hull and bridge deck. Okay, and what about in the middle? Because a lot of them have got like this little, little bit like a jet ski. You've got like a, a like a mini. It's, I wouldn't call it a, a keel, but is the shape of it is you know rather than being like completely like a, an arc, you have like a almost a, a, an M shaped where you've got something in the middle. You mean the stringer or a kind of pod, kind of pod in, in the middle? It, it, down the middle of the boat. I mean, I've seen this on I've seen this on sea winds, but I've also seen it on like the Fontaine Pajot Sayonas. Now they've got like a in in the middle of the bridge deck. There's like a you know it's curved round. That I'm assuming is done to kind of reduce slamming and enable water and air to pass more freely. Um, it does help for the for the structure. It's kind of a stringer. It's a it's a it's a stringer on the on the sea wind. Um, it's for the, the water tank, so it helps to center the weight. Um, and um, when a wave hits, if it hits like a uh, V-shape, it will create less, less noise, less stress than uh, hitting a flat surface. Simple. Okay. I'm assuming now that seeing as computer-aided design is now you know, commonplace, whereas it never used to be that things like bridge deck shape is now advancing hugely um, as you're able to model in advance of construction the effect of wind and waves and air on, on the underside of a catamaran. Because we've seen some, you know, the newer, the, the newer designs seem really quite sleek. Yes, uh, to be honest, uh, we... We don't, the CFD for, as an architect, it's more for the hull, hull design rather than for the uh, aer aerodynamic um, because that's not the main, uh, that's not the main um, characteristic of performance. No, but not performance, but I'm talking about comfort on board. When we're talking about slamming and how a boat will slam or how the, the noise and water passes through, you know, you can use, you know, modeling to, to work that out, can't you? You can. Uh, I don't do it personally. Uh, it's, um, uh, it's experience again. 
Okay, so again, we're talking about something we discussed in a previous episode about art versus science. Your experience is that if you have, you know, you don't use a model when you can, you've got a tried and tested formula from previous designs. Yeah, you watch, um, you watch how the, the, the current cat behave, and then you can uh, draw a conclusion from that. And uh, you have so many catamarans uh, that you can make your own conclusion, what's working, what's uh, not working. Yeah, it's, it's super interesting. Listen, thank you for that, Antoine. The, again, we've covered some pretty uh, intense and, you know, and important topics here. So thank you for that. We will come back with another episode dealing with yet more intricacies of Cataran design. Thank you so much to Antoine. Absolute pleasure. If you enjoyed this episode, we have a lot of previous technical episodes discussing different aspects of Cataran design. So if you are looking to buy a Cataran, either new or used from anywhere on the market, this may be a real uh, interest to you. So thank you for watching this episode. We'll be back again with another episode and we'll see you again soon. Goodbye. So I hope you enjoyed that episode on catamaran design. If you haven't already done so, there are more episodes in this series and we'll be back again soon with more discussion, including one on the actual ingredients that go into the fiberglass and the materials of the build. That is super important and I promise you, you're not gonna wanna miss this. See you soon, goodbye.